20, and of course I didn't underline it in my book. Um, one still follows the old habits, right? So this is, and I actually do want to find this. Uh, one, one still follows the old habits. Yeah, okay, so it's on uh, page 16 of Kaufman, note 20, and it goes from, goes to tasks. Okay, so, what am I doing? Complicit is being here. Okay, um, page 16, note 20, and the Kaufman text. Sort of halfway down in note, uh, in note 20. One still follows the old habit and seeks another, in italics, one still follows the old habit and seeks another authority that can speak unconditionally and command goals and tasks. That's precisely what I'm attempting to describe, right? So, um, and we can even read the, the, the sentence before that, right? The sentence says, having unlearned faith in that, one still follows the old habit and seeks another, so, and it's in italics, right, some other moral imperative, seeks another authority that can speak unconditionally, thou shall, you will, right, you must, speak unconditionally and command goals and tasks. So what Nietzsche is saying, Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's conception, and at this point I think he's, you know, it's, I think this is just really good philosophy, he's saying, listen, you have to recognize that it isn't so much, right, don't get caught up in the notion that it is the Christian moral imperative that is just you know, he has problems with Kantian deontology, no question about that. He has, he has problems with Christian morality, no question about that. But it's not simply the case that it's this sort of attack against Kantian deontology and the thing on itself and so on. It's not just the case that it's this attack on Christian morality. But what he's saying is you need to recognize the structure of the system, right? If you substitute in some new moral imperative and you haven't transformed the nature of the system, specifically judgments, right, you shall not do this, then, you know, you're, 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 you're I don't know what you're doing. It's, it's sloppy, right? You, you're thinking that you've emancipated yourself. You're thinking that you've freed yourself. But all you've done is you've substituted one form of, and this is Nietzsche, right, you know, one form of um, domination for another form of domination, right? You've, you've substituted Christian, um, Christian moral, the Christian moral imperative as a system of domination for Kantian deontology, if you will, as, uh, as your preferred system of domination. Nietzsche, I think, if I'm correct, and, and if you think I might be wrong, tell me in the notes, right? Tell me, comment on this, because, you know, um, I think I'm right. I think Nietzsche would say, listen, you're, just, you're basically just sort of moral system hopping, right? But you're still putting yourself in a state of domination, and you really haven't done anything um, to either recognize the nature of the structure of the system, or recognize the nature of your domination, to be technical, right? So, uh, I think that's important as well. Okay, um, we're going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the two forms of nihilism. I'm not going to get into any major discourse now, because he's going to um, address this idea later, and we'll return to the idea of both active and passive. The two forms are active nihilism, passive nihilism. But he just he just introduces right the first time, um, and you know as I said this is the this is I've read this text several times, and I, I try to be more methodical in my read this time because obviously I'm presenting for 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 lecture. Um, the idea of the active and passive nihilism, I think if I was not mistaken, I've, it's only 22 notes in is first introduced at note 22, right? So active nihilism, and I can write this down, for Nietzsche is increased power of spirit, right? The increase in the power of spirit. I'll talk about what that means, sort of the type of persona, if you will, or the type of personality that the active nihilist, okay, yeah, I do talk about Buddhism now. The type of personality that the active nihilist is. The second is passive nihilism, the passive nihilist, um, and this is a decline, a recession in the power of the spirit. And he actually gives the um, example of um, the Buddhists, right? Or Buddhist, Bo Buddhism, right? Suggest that Buddhism is a form of passive, passive nihilism. I actually do want to read a little bit of that from note 23. Okay, uh, page 18 in the Kaufman, note 23, last paragraph. 
It's opposite the wary nihilism that no longer attacks. Its most famous form, actually let me read the, the, the little bit before. It reaches its maximum of relative strength as a violent force of destruction, as active nihilism. Its opposite, the wary nihilism that no longer attacks, its most famous form, Buddhism, a passive nihilism, a sign of weakness. The strength of the spirit may be worn out, exhausted, so that previous goals and values have become incommensurate and no longer are believed, so that the synthesis of values and goals dissolves and the individual values war against each other. And then he goes through sort of the polemics, right? Um, which we'll talk about later. So what Nietzsche is, is attempting to say is there's a sense in which you can be nihilistic, and I don't want to get into it yet because he hasn't yet fully fleshed out the concept, but there's a sense in which you can be actively nihilistic, and this is a more sort of proactive nihilism, right? Um, later we'll see it's a, attached to this idea of creativity that I talked about in the first, in originality that I first talked about as a key, key point in the text. And that passive nihilism, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily go so far as it's a lack of creativity as it's sort of a sort of introvertedness within the particular within the persona of the individual nihilist. Again, we don't have I'm jumping the gun way, way ahead. As we progress, just keep that in the back of your mind. It'll make more sense of of the two different forms of nihilism. And I, again, I'll reintroduce this. The good thing about this is if you have notes, so you just do a control F type in the word you're looking for, it'll pop up in the notes. So if you're looking for active nihilism, you'll be able to see all the markers of active nihilism throughout the PDF as, as the notes get longer and longer and longer. Okay, causes of nihil, uh, nihilism. Um, higher species, lower species. This concept can be misleading, right? You read higher species, lower species, and you think, okay, you know, here's where the, here's where the controversial stuff crawls in. Um, I think there's an, a, a very obvious sort of banal explanation for this, right? Characterized by fertility and power to, quote, the higher species. The higher species. Characterized by fertility and power to keep up the faith in man. Right? So there's faith in man. And we'll say humanity. Right? Faith in humanity. The lower species, the herd or masses. This is very, very important. We'll return to this idea. Um, many, 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 many subsequent philosophers talk about this notion of sort of herd mentality. Right? Uh, Freud, uh, as a psychologist, psychoanalyst, talks about the, the, the herd. Um, before, before, before we even get to sort of national socialism, we get, and I've, talk, I've done an extensive series on um, Jose Ortega y Gasset's Revolt of the Masses, Gasset talks about the idea of the herd, sort of this uniform collective, um, not only mentality, right, it's not just the action and the way in which individuals think, but for Nietzsche, this lower species, right, right, for Nietzsche, the lower species, and this is a quote from note uh, 27, Insofar as the mass is dominant, it bullies the exceptions, right? And no one does this better. Nietzsche does this good, but Gassette does it better. Gassette talks about how that bullying goes about, right? The masses are dominant. The middle class is dominant, right? The middle class is aspiring, just quick tangent. The middle class, and this is all actually Gassette, middle class is aspiring for um, aristocracy or the upper class, the elite class, if you will, the rich um, and they want to oppress the lower class, right? So that if you have sort of this three strata class system, lower class, middle class, upper class, middle class want nothing more in life than appropriations and benefits um, in order to elevate themselves to the highest sort of echelon of social status. But they recognize that people in the lower class are attempting uh, and could potentially compete with them uh, for a position in this middle rung. So what they do is they dominate and oppress. And that's what Nietzsche is saying here. Um, but there's no question about it, at least for me, Gassette does a remarkable job because almost all of his text is about the masses, right? The, the mentality of the masses, right? So the lower class, the herd, the masses, the quote is, insofar as the mass is dominant, right? They're the most, and, and they're also, in a sense, the most powerful. They have the most influence. It bullies the exceptions, right? Okay. Um... At that point, I want to 
I want to conclude this segment of the analysis. Um, what I'm going to do in subsequent videos is continue the assessment, not just on the masses, but of this, this notion of emptiness and the vacuum that the masses attempt to fill, right? this void that the masses attempt to fill um, through indulgence, intoxication, uh, narcotization, I can't say that word, narcotic, I can't say the word, narcotization, right, You're getting drugged up, <laughs> basically, intoxicating yourself, indulging yourself, right, so this idea of the masses is sort of inextricably, inextricably bound, bound to the notion of emptiness, and you know, this, again, you know, it's not, it's not, um, it's not uncommon that you will see many, many different forms of psychology and psychoanalysis borrowing these concepts from Nietzsche because there is a sense in which, psychologically speaking, even psychoanalytically speaking, and I'm neither, that senses of emptiness, feelings of emptiness, are, are frequently pacified, subdued by um, acts of intoxication and indulgence. And what we'll see in, this, in, in the next section of the analysis is how this process unfolds, how it contributes to further pessimism, how that pessimism unravels into uh, deeper nihilism, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, um, hopefully we've uh, been successful in extending more of the, uh, the discourse today. I think the most important uh, concept so far um, in this particular section, in this series, um, in this segment of the series, is the idea that despite the fact, right, and this is important, I just want to end on this note, despite the fact that we've done away with, arguably, for Nietzsche, the um, Christian moral conception of God, we've left the system in place, and all we've done is substituted a new moral imperative in the place of the former, formerly existing Christian morality, and in a sense we are, you know, choosing a different poison, right? We still adhere and subscribe to a system of domination. So, uh, uh, I hope that makes sense. It, you know, it's pretty technical stuff, but if I was successful, I hope that made sense. Okay, so um, with that, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.